Well, tonight uh, I'm going to talk about really kind of two things. Um, one is a general framework for analyzing regulation, uh, which is actually written down in executive orders uh, from the president in every administration since Richard Nixon that federal agencies are actually supposed to follow. And the, the economic rationality in this framework, you will find, uh, you may find it surprising to hear that this is something that the federal government is actually supposed to do. Uh, and secondly, though, I want to apply that framework to talk about homeland security related regulation, in particular talk about how well uh, the Department of Homeland Security is doing when it tries to apply this framework to various regulations, uh, particularly the, the most significant regulations it has issued since it was created. Uh, this is, by the way, a, a piece of research I've been working on jointly uh, with a lawyer named uh, Jamie Belcor, who's a legal fellow at the Mercatus Center uh, this year. So the, those of you who are contemplating law school, if you're really into regulation, you may have an opportunity to spend a year with us as a legal fellow at some time in the future, uh, studying fascinating stuff like this. Well, the first question that you have to ask, at least in this town, is uh, the first question you have to answer is, well, we all know <clears throat> that security is very important in, in the wake of 9-11. Uh, why do we want to mess with this analysis stuff? Why don't we just go ahead and do it? And there are several reasons uh, for applying some type of an analytical framework to think about homeland security. One is because presumably we want to do stuff that's effective and not waste time with doing things that are not effective. And because resources are, are not limited. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, an intuitive idea, though, that's sometimes lost on folks in the policy sphere that, uh, you know, we always make choices about where to use resources. Uh, some uses of resources may be more effective than others. Therefore, it makes sense to maybe spend some time thinking about what we're doing in order to identify the most effective things to do. Uh, there are some other reasons where it might be especially important to do some analysis in regard to homeland security. Um, several government uh, organizations, including the Government Accountability Office, refers to uh, government functions that, where citizens have a direct interface with government as high-impact functions, that's because that's where, uh, that's where the rubber meet the road, meets the road, where those of us as citizens have to, a uh, direct relationship and encounter with the folks who work for the federal government. And an awful lot of things the Department of Homeland Security does actually does involve this kind of high-impact interface where we are faced, you and I are faced with a real person who works for the federal government doing something, whether it's airport security, whether it's people checking uh, IDs at border crossings and whatnot. Uh, another reason to spend time analyzing homeland security uh, is that it's pretty costly. It's pretty costly. Um, Home, Department of Homeland Security spends about $21 billion on regulatory activity. A big chunk of that is what is spent to pay all of the uh, screeners at the airports after the uh, federal government uh, federalized airport screening. In addition, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, like all other regulatory agencies, can conscript private sector resources by issuing regulations telling us what we have to do. And by its own estimates, the regulations the Department of Homeland Security has issued in the five years since its inception uh, led to costs, at least before they issued the regulations, they estimated that these costs would be about four or five billion dollars annually. And another reason to do some analysis is that uh, there are a lot of other values at stake in the Homeland Security debate, uh, often things that are pretty important to a lot of people, but are not necessarily easy to quantify or monetize, such as personal liberty or privacy. I have to admit, I, I have not been able to find uh, a way to yet quantify or monetize the fact that the experience traveling in an airplane and going through airports is just lousy, or lousier than it used to be uh, before 9-11 five years ago uh, with some of the new security measures they had. So a lot of good reasons to actually spend some time thinking about what we're doing. Now, there is a framework for regulatory analysis that's been enunciated in a number of executive orders. And if you look back through the history of it, uh, you can find that a number of prominent economists who were serving in government had a significant impact on how this stuff was written up. Uh, but you can, you can uh, lay out a lot of kind of clauses and details about what has to be done. But these are the essential steps in analyzing regulations. One, first, identify the desired outcomes. In other words, figure out what is the thing of value to citizens that the regulation is supposed to accomplish. 
And how do you measure that? And how do you know that the regulation actually will accomplish that result? What's the evidence that the regulation will actually, that you have chosen the appropriate means to accomplish the result you want? Uh, assess the evidence of market failure or other systemic problem. You know, basic concept of market failure, I, don't, uh, I won't go through the, the gory details, but the basic concept of market failure is that there are certain situations where mutually beneficial exchanges could have occurred between people, but they don't occur for various reasons, either high costs of transactions, high costs of organizing people, uh, information problems, and, and some other things that have been pretty well identified by, econ by economists and, and well-worn. Uh, and so... Uh, it has been uh, a long-standing tradition in the executive orders that lay out regulatory analysis uh, to say, hey, you know, agency, when you're lay laying out a regulation, you need to identify the market failure or the other problem you're trying to solve. Uh, this may come as a surprise to some of y'all, uh, particularly folks maybe who have some background econom in economics, but not everything the federal government does is intended to remedy a market failure. Sometimes the federal government does things for other reasons, uh, to do for reasons other than economic efficiency. Uh, nevertheless, if, if a federal agency is in fact issuing a regulation that's supposed to accomplish something other than remedying a market failure, they still have a responsibility to identify what kind of systemic problem are they trying to solve and how do you know that it's actually a significant problem? Uh, is it perhaps some sort of a government failure problem? Uh, where you know previous federal or state policies have caused some kind of problem that you're trying to fix, uh, or is the policy and the regulation simply intended to redistribute wealth from one group of people to another? Uh, sometimes uh, folks in the federal government are pretty explicit that that is indeed what they're trying to do, and if so, uh, they need to lay out you know what the systemic problem is they are trying to solve by redistributing wealth and uh, how they will know when they've solved it. So assess the evidence of market failure or the other, some other systemic problem. Um, identify the federal government's unique role. I hope the term comparative advantage is not a stranger to you anymore, but that, and that's basically what we're getting at. Uh, the fact that there may be a market failure or some other problem, uh, which to some people would justify having government do something, does not necessarily mean that the federal government is the best level to do it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with security, you can imagine some situations where if some level of government is going to do something, maybe it makes sense for it to be a federal responsibility. If you imagine, uh, say, border crossing and, and uh, you know, checking folks as they come across the border to make sure they're not terrorists, if you leave that up to individual states, uh, since we have free movement between the states in this country, you can imagine that might lead to some certain types of free rider problems. Suppose a state like Montana uh, were to say, well, you know, checking people when they come across the border is kind of costly to, you know, try to figure out whether they're terrorists, and there isn't really anything in Montana that terrorists are going to want to uh, destroy anyway, so we're just not going to bother with that expense. Well, what happens? Terrorists come in through Montana and then migrate to other states where there are things that they may want to destroy. Uh, so, I mean, obviously this is a highly simplified example, but the general idea is there might be some situations where some type of federal role is, is indeed the most appropriate way to deal with the problems. Uh, there may be other situations. You can imagine, say, evacuation plans from major cities where it's hard to imagine uh, a huge federal role in making the evacuation plan uh, and, and where it may be much more appropriately a, a state or local responsibility. Assess the effectiveness of alternative approaches. Number one was identify the desired outcomes. Okay, There are always going to be uh, a multitude of different ways that you can try to achieve the same outcome, reducing the risk of terrorism, reducing the risk that a terrorist may entry the, enter the country, reducing the amount of damage that may occur as a result of a hurricane, you know, whatever the outcome is that you're trying to deal with with a, uh, with a homeland security regulation. Uh, there may be many different ways of accomplishing the same outcomes, uh, which is why for many years, uh, federal agencies have been obligated to look at alternative ways of uh, trying to solve the problem that they are trying to solve. And they're supposed to, in advance of promulgating regulation, analyze a number of different alternatives to figure out which ones might be the most effective and figure out the costs of each of them. Number five is identify the costs. Uh, costs may be very direct in the sense of federal spending. Costs may be somewhat indirect in the sense that you know, private businesses or individuals have to spend money to do stuff 
because the federal government issued a regulation telling them to do it. Uh, costs may also be very hidden and require a certain amount of more detailed analysis uh, to uncover. Uh, for example, one of our most common interfaces with uh, the Department of Homeland Security is when we get on airplanes and we have, we have airport screeners. Uh, and there are a number of additional delays and things that were introduced as a result of the increased security measures after 9-11. Well, you can imagine that, you know, the obvious and direct costs of that are what do you have to pay these people to do that job? Uh, but there are some indirect costs as well. There's inconvenience and extra time that passengers spend getting to the airport, getting to the airport earlier to make sure they don't miss their flight in case the security line is long. Uh, their time has a value. Uh, so the value of people's time is an important cost that has to be considered. Uh, there are also very indirect costs, which are the costs that flow from the changes in behavior that occur because regulation alters prices or alters other, other aspects of the product. And there's a decent amount of research in, in airline economics that finds that after 9-11, you got an increase in fees to pay for security. You got an increase in wait times as a result of security. So what are rational people going to do in response to that change in incentives? When possible, folks are going to substitute something else for flying. And in fact, uh, after 9-11, you got a big bump up uh, or a big reduction in the amount of short haul airline travel where it was a lot easier to substitute traveling by car. Uh, and there's only one little problem with that. Which is safer per mile traveling, automobile travel or airline travel? How many people say automobile? How many people say airline? Yeah, per mile airline travel is a lot safer. So that on average, uh, the effect of the improved security after 9-11 was to induce some additional automobile fatalities because people, either because they didn't want to deal with the wait times or they didn't want to deal with the higher ticket prices, opted to travel shorter distances uh, in cars when they could have flown. Heck, I did that. I was working for the federal government at the time, and, and uh, maybe five months after 9-11, I had to go to a meeting down in Raleigh-Durham and uh, ended up driving rather than flying because I sat down and figured out by the time I mess around with getting to the airport and doing security for an hour and a half and getting on the plane and then flying down and then getting a rental car, it was going to be quicker to drive. Uh, a colleague of mine flew, and it was pretty much a tie. We got into a big argument over, the because I got stuck in a storm, but her airplane was also sitting at National in the same storm. We, we got in this argument over who would have got there first if there wasn't a storm, and, and uh, these, these lawyers we were meeting with were looking at us like, are, are you guys a little competitive? And, and my colleague just looked at him and said, well, we work for a competition agency. What do you expect? Finally, compare costs with outcomes. Okay, if you know what, you, once you know what the costs are, in number one, you've identified the desired outcomes and hopefully you've analyzed to figure out how much are you reducing the risk or how many lives are you going to save as a result of this regulation. Then you can compare that with the costs to try to figure out which option might be more cost effective, which option uh, might you decide is worth doing because you know, it's a relatively cheap way to reduce risk, save lives, which options maybe you don't want to do because it's a very, very expensive way to reduce risk and there are other ways that are less expensive. Those are the basic elements of regulatory analysis. Now what I've done for about the past 10 minutes is spoke to you in econo geek speak. Here's what it is in plain English. Step number one, figure out what you're trying to do and how you know you did it. Step number two, figure out why the government needs to do it figure out what level of government needs to do it, think about the different ways to do it and find the most effective one, uh, figure out what you have to give up to do whatever you're trying to do, and weigh the pros and cons. I doubt many reasonable people could look at any of the items on this list in plain, plain English and say, no, you shouldn't do that when making a decision. I mean, th this regulatory analysis framework really is just sort of decision making for dummies decision-making 101, yet you would be amazed at how controversial some of these concepts can be in the context of particular reg regulations in Washington when, you know, somebody gets an idea and they want to push something, and as a result, they don't want to talk about costs. Oh, if you say there's costs, that must mean you're against it because, you know, costs are a negative thing and you're bringing up costs because you're trying to stop it. No, I'm talking about costs because we want to know, you know, what the effects of this thing are, uh, and so on. Okay, Department of Homeland Security uh, must do this type of, of analysis as a result of several statutes and executive orders. 
Uh, there was something, only in Washington can we name stuff like this, but there was something called the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act that Congress passed that requires agencies to do a cost-benefit analysis of any regulation uh, that causes either other levels of government or the private sector to spend more than $100 million. There's something called the Regulatory Flexibility Act, and there are regulations like that that are that costly. There's something called the Regulatory Flexibility Act. This is actually intended to reduce the burden of regulation specifically on small businesses, so agencies have an obligation to uh, review the effects of their regulations on small businesses and figure out ways to mitigate the burden on small businesses. Uh, and then finally, I mentioned uh, an executive order issued by the president several times. The current executive order governing, the, governing this is called Executive Order 12866. It was actually written in the Clinton administration. Uh, it has several predecessors. Uh, probably the, the strongest version of this regulatory order, uh, the, excuse me, executive order, was uh, implemented in the Reagan administration. Uh, but if you go back in history, you find Jimmy Carter had one of these, Richard, uh, Gerald Ford had one of these, Richard Nixon had one of these, and it was all rooted in a realization in the early 70s that, gee, regulation costs something, and so maybe we ought to think about the costs before we do something. Department of Homeland Security, being a cabinet agency, is subject to these exec executive orders. Uh, some federal agencies are not because they're not considered part of the executive branch. Okay, so how well has Homeland Security analyzed proposed regulations? Uh, here's what we did to try to figure this out. We took all of the regulations that are regarded as economically significant that Homeland Security has issued since the department was created. Econo an economically significant regulation is one that leads to an expenditure of $100 million or more. And those regulations are singled out for special scrutiny in the executive order and other places. So we took all of those. There were 14 of them. 13 of them. 13 or 14. I lost count. There were so many. But there were 13 or 14 of the, these in the first five years that the Department of Homeland Security was created. And we came up with a scheme for evaluating how well the agency did each of those six pieces of regulatory analysis. If there was no discussion of, of that aspect at all, it got a zero for that thing. So if they had a regulation, they didn't do any analysis of costs, they got a zero. Oh, by the way, the, the regulatory analysis is actually the name of a, of a specific document that the agency is supposed to produce and make available to the public when it proposes the regulation. It's called a, formally it's called a regulatory impact analysis. So in theory, for each of these regulations, we had a document we could read to understand what analysis they did. In practice, there wasn't always a freestanding document like this that existed, but there was a, there's usually a section in the proposed rule that talks about their analysis. So if they didn't discuss some aspect at all, they got a zero. If they did what looked like a, real, a pretty, good, pretty good and complete job, they got a five, and these other things are rated in between. I mean, what do you expect? We're at a university. We see all these analyses they did, so we sat down and decided we'd grade some papers. That's, this was basically an exercise in grading papers. Um, we did not try to second guess whether the Department of Homeland Security made the right decision whether it should have written the regulation differently or not. We're not judging the regulation. We're just judging how good and how complete was the analysis. 13 major regulations. And there they are. Uh, and the uh, annual cost figures come out of the regulatory analysis that the Department of Homeland Security itself furnished. So this is just their estimate of the costs. Uh, some of these are qu quite, quite big ranges of costs. In a few cases, it wasn't always clear from the analysis what this thing was going to cost, even though the agencies are supposed to figure out what these things cost. Uh, but those are the size of the, or the those are the regulations and, and the size of the cost. And here's how they scored. The top scoring, um, the top scoring regulation was a regulation uh, that, that um, this was actually the, the Western Hemisphere fear travel documents regulation. Uh, the talk that uh, implemented requirements that now people going to and from, Americans going to and from places like Canada and Mexico and Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago and, and uh, places and Bermuda and places like that would now have to have uh, passports. 
they earned a score of 15. Now, we had six criteria, count them, six, six criteria, and they could earn uh, up to five points on each criterion. So the maximum possible score was 30. So the best analysis, the best analysis earned a 50%. Uh, and if you go on down the line, passenger manifests, this has to do with uh, airlines and cruise lines reporting information on passengers so the government could check to see if there's any nasty people on board. Uh, that was the one that came in second to 12. Way down here at the bottom, community disaster loans enacted in 2005 earned only three little points. This was a regulation that came out of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which essentially laid out how local governments could get loans from the federal government uh, in response to natural disasters. That's the kind of regulation, a regulation that simply lays out how the federal government's going to spend money and how uh, various parties can be eligible for it. That type of regulation in general tends to get less scrutiny uh, in the federal government than regulations which actually tell people in the private sector that they must do this or that. If we look for patterns in this, because you know we're economists, so we saw some numbers, so we look for patterns. Basically, if you want to know whether there's a trend, over time, there's generally a trend toward improvement, although there are some not so good scores in the later years, as well as some better scores in the later years. The one thing we don't see is high scores in the early years. So they do seem to be improving over time, um, even though none of the analysis are really great in terms of the absolute score, the score they earned compared to you know, where they ought to be if you read the federal documents that lay out what they're supposed to be doing. Uneven improvement over, over time. Uh, we also look to see whether some of the sub-agencies within Homeland Security seem to be doing a better or worse job. And the only thing that maybe sort of looks like a pattern is that it seems like uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, tends to do a, a better job of analysis than most of the rest of Homeland Security. It also seems like the Coast Guard tends to do not a great job Although, in fairness, I should mention that three of these Coast Guard regulations put out in 2003 were uh, all done together, and the analysis was done the same way, and it wasn't really great. So um, this might make the Coast Guard look worse than it is, because uh, the, the, there were three regulations there that were kind of done uh, all the same way, and very early in the process. Now, if we look at what kind of things the uh, Homeland Security did well in these regulations and what kinds of things it didn't well, didn't do well. Um, they tended to do a better job of analyzing and identifying costs. And, you know, they have contractors who can go out there and try to figure out, you know, what kind of money the private sector is going to have to spend in order to comply with regulations. So maybe that's not a surprise. Um, they, did, they, they did, you know, a somewhat, somewhat of an okay job on um, identifying and measuring the outcome they're trying to create. That is, they could actually, in most cases, they could actually tell you what they're trying to accomplish with the regulation. Uh, quite frankly, the score, the average score, 1.46, what this tells you is that mostly they were able to say what the goal of the regulation was. They weren't really doing a good job of measuring whether, uh, you know, whether they were, would be able to accomplish the goal or not. Um, and then they, you know, they, they generally did something to compare costs and outcomes. And you'll notice over here, under number of zeros, for these three groups of, of uh, criteria, um, every regulatory analysis just about did something that addressed these. But now we have a second group of criteria down here, analyzing alternatives, where the average score was about one, and there were five analyses that didn't even look at alternatives identifying the systemic problem, you know, the market failure or other problem you're trying to solve. You'd think if you're issuing a regulation to achieve something, you would need to identify what problem you're trying to solve in order to be effective, right? Well, the score on that was pretty bad, and there were seven of these analyses that didn't even say anything about it. Uh, and finally, identifying why the federal government has a unique role was the worst criterion, and uh, a lot of these analyses didn't say anything about it either. So... Ah, not, not so great. There's a number of areas that are uh, concern, that should be areas of concern. Uh, to give you an example of, you know, what it takes to get a good score on this, I mentioned the, travel, the Western Hemisphere Travel Documents regulation that now says we have to have passports 
if we want to go to places like and like Canada and Mexico, and then come back if we're American citizens. The uh, the analysis that went into that rule, uh, we gave that a five. Their cost analysis because they. They seem to do a pretty comprehensive job of identifying the monetary costs. They estimated the effects on prices because they said, hey, there are people who are going to have to go and, and pay for passports who did not have to have passports before, and that's an increase in the cost of traveling to Canada, Mexico, Bermuda, and so forth. So they factored that in as, as an increase in the cost of travel, which made sense. Uh, they actually based on uh, economic analysis of the elasticity of demand for airline travel, you know, how price sensitive is airline travel to various places and various kinds of passengers. They actually estimated the number of people that they think just would forego traveling overseas as a result of this additional expense that they're imposing on consumers. That was kind of nice. Um, and they estimated the value uh, of that lost opportunity to those passengers. So about 652,000 people are foregoing travel, and that means the, the passengers and the airlines together forego about $140, $104 million of value. That's, for those of you with economics backgrounds, that's a deadweight loss associated with the regulation. They did a sensitivity analysis because they said, well, you know, we may not have the numbers exactly right, so let's see how the estimates change if we're off on some of our assumptions. So they did a sensitivity analysis, and they had a, they had a range of, of costs depending on whether the, how true their assumptions are, it might cost as little as $147 million or as much as $733 million in the first year. That's quite a range. Uh, but I give them credit for doing it. And they also analyzed un uncertainty, uh, the possibility that you know, some of this stuff might not be right, some of it might be kind of random. Um, and, and they looked at, well, what's the most likely estimate of the cost? What are some unlikely estimates of the cost? So they generally did a pretty thorough job. On examining outcomes, the passenger manifest regulation had a good example of doing some things well, but not some other things well. Uh, they identified a couple of outcomes, you know, keeping nasty people off airplanes and avoiding the cost to airlines and passengers when you discover after the plane is in flight, there's some kind of a risky person on it, and then the flight has to be diverted, so they have to pull that person off. Um, on the other hand, they didn't really measure uh, or identify how well this was going to contribute to reducing the, ri the risk of terrorism. Is, is this a big deal or is this a little deal? They didn't really, they didn't really do that very well. Uh, one strengths on their outcome uh, analysis is they were actually able to uh, look at the, they were actually able to measure these avoided costs that they were talking about, um, but they didn't do anything to measure this, this safety outcome, which is probably the bigger thing of, of public concern. They had a pretty decent theory that explained how the regulation would accomplish the goal. <coughs> Basically, airlines had to forward information about passengers when the passenger checks in. It's automatically checked with a database of dangerous people, and if it's somebody who shouldn't be flying, they don't get a boarding pass. So pretty, pretty straightforward theory. Um, on the other hand, not all airlines use that system, and they just sort of arbitrarily assumed how effective the regulation would be in uh, keeping nasty people off of the airplanes of usually smaller airlines who don't use the automated query system when they're checking passengers in. Uh, finally, it, it was nice that they acknowledged the rule wouldn't be 100% perfect effective. Uh, they assumed it would be 90% effective, and then they gave no basis for telling us uh, why 90% was a reasonable assumption. So they got an OK score on it, but you know, it, was, it had some weaknesses. In summary, and I'm going to skip over the one other thing. Uh, in the interest of time, since everybody's already had a long day and it's probably getting hot out there. In summary, none of these analyses are complete. Uh, some of the more recent ones are better. The features of the analysis that involve estimating costs and benefits are the things where they did a better job, but they didn't do a very good job of looking at alternatives, looking at the systemic problem, looking at the federal role, which means what? That basically these analyses are an analysis of the costs and the benefits of the regulation they issued, not an examination of alternative ways to accomplish the goal. Why do we see these results we see? Uh, we've talked to folks, we looked at the numbers, and, and various things come up. One is there's, there's something called Circular A4 that laid out in great detail how to do regulatory analysis. It wasn't issued until September 2003. 
uh, which would have made it hard for the folks doing the regulations issued in 2003 to follow all of the detailed instructions that the federal government put out. So maybe part of the problem was inadequate knowledge on the part of folks at uh, Homeland Security, which might explain the low scores for the regulations issued in 2003. Another reason, shortage of regulatory economists who are actually competent to do this kind of analysis. Now, I don't want to make too many presumptions about the folks who come into the Koch Summer Fellows Program, but I will presume that when you hear a federal agency has a good, hasn't done a good job because they don't have enough people, you might be suspicious of that as an explanation. A and I was too. But let me show you something. Okay, the you know, Department of Homeland Security is a pretty big department. They issued these major, major regulations, four or five billion dollars of cost per year in the private sector. Um, and if you ask how many economists they had, at the time we talked to them back in uh, January, they had exactly 10 economists whose job it was to analyze regulations. They were out, the economists in the Department of Homeland Security are outnumbered 15,900 to one, which is a, a pretty darn high ratio. Now, we informally surveyed some folks we knew in other federal agencies. The Environmental Protection Agency, which you might not think of as a, as, as a hotbed of economic analysis, they got 200 economists who work on regulation. So they're only outnumbered there 90 to one. Uh, Food and Drug Administration, well, they're not so good, 500 to 1. Uh, Department of Agriculture has 220 economists, but they also have a lot of employees. Uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, they only have nine economists, but it's a pretty small agency. So the ratio of economists to others is, is fairly high. And then there's a couple of other economically oriented regulatory agencies, the Federal Communications Commission and uh, the Federal Trade Commission, where since a lot of what they do is economics oriented, maybe it's not surprising that they have a pretty respectable ratio of economists to, uh, to everybody else. But yeah, DHS, they're, they're outnumbered. And I made the mistake of well, one of my friends, I asked for numbers in another agency. I, I, ma I made the, the mistake of using the phrase uh, outgunned instead of outnumbered. Uh, and he said something about, well, yeah, of course the economists are outgunned at DHS. Some of the people who work there carry guns. Well, it's a lot funnier if you're sitting here in your office and you read it in an email, okay? <laughs> All right, so, so there might be a, there, there may, have, may be a problem here that they just don't have the people to, uh, to do the analysis that they're supposed to be doing. Uh, there are a couple other things we found. Some other things we found is that statutory deadlines. Seven of these rules that we looked at began as what are called interim final rules with deadlines mandated by Congress. And you know, it can take a year or so to do, a year or two, to do a really good regulatory analysis, okay? But you have, when you have rules where Congress says, you shall issue this rule by this date, and it's six months from now or a year from now, it's not really conducive to doing very careful analysis. And we have some statistics on that too. If you look at the interim final rules, which are the ones that had very short congressional deadlines, versus the final rules where there was more time to work on it, you find that uh, we had something called a transparency score that I didn't explain earlier, which basically measures how easy was it to find the regulatory analysis where you're supposed to be able to find it. Um, and we found that when the, when the rule was a final rule, it was much easier to find the regulatory analysis. But look at this difference in the, in the average scores. Um, the regulatory analysis was 50% better when you had a rule that was issued as a final rule, which means it went through the normal process that regulations are supposed to go, to go through, where the agency issues it as a proposal before it's implemented, the public can comment on it, the agency takes the comments, they revise it, they put out another final rule, they might go through several rounds of comments if they want more input from the public, rather than an interim final rule, which is a rule that the agency just tosses out there and says, okay, we're putting this into place now. And oh, by the way, if anybody wants to comment on it, go ahead. So it looks like the, the rush deadlines uh, that, that are often imposed by Congress for security stuff because they want to do something um, has an effect on the quality of the analysis. Um, the other thing we noticed is that, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these regulatory analyses did not do a very good job of looking at alternative ways to solve the problem. 
if they're and, and and they didn't do a very good job of analyzing whether there is a problem to begin with, and they didn't do a very good job of analyzing whether the federal government is the most appropriate level of government to do it. Uh, in most cases, the agencies got very little discretion from Congress to make decisions about the regulation that could have been influenced by the analysis of those factors. The typical uh, major security regulation that we looked at was essentially Congress saying, you will issue a rule that says, um, you will issue a rule that says people have to do this. Not, you know, you will issue a rule that makes us safer and you figure out how to do it. So in a lot of cases, it's quite possible that the folks at the, at the Department of Homeland Security didn't feel like analysis of alternatives or the market failure or the federal role I don't think they felt like it would have much effect on the final decision because Congress already mandated exactly what kind of regulation they had to issue. And so they may have thought, well, especially with only 10 economists, we're not going to spend our time doing that analysis because it's not going to have an effect on the decision. Uh, so that's, that's under, an understandable reaction, um, but that doesn't necessarily, uh, that, that's not necessarily an acceptable excuse, I don't think, since the executive orders from the president that manage the federal government say they're supposed to analyze this stuff. Uh, and, you know, what the heck? Maybe if an agency analyzed alternatives to a particular regulation and turned up some new information, either the president or Congress might say, hey, maybe we ought to do it differently. Look what the people at Homeland Security found, who are the experts we delegated this, this rule to. Look at what these people found. Maybe we ought to rethink this law we passed. But that, that doesn't really happen much uh, because of the way the analysis is done. Okay, finally we have some suggestions. What can Homeland Security do? And by the way, we, we have shared these suggestions or are in the process of sharing these suggestions with the relevant decision makers. Well, get more economists, that's pretty obvious. Uh, less obvious, but pretty important, based on some other research my colleagues at Mercatus have done, is make objective analysis their job. Make, in other words, hire and manage the economists in such a way that their job is to figure out what reality actually is rather than putting together an analysis that justifies whatever it is that the department's decided to do for other reasons. Uh, get ahead of the curve, uh, engage in a proactive program of research to try to better flesh out and understand the problems and alternative solutions before Congress steps in and legislates a particular solution. Uh, and, you know, in general, look at, all, look at a wide variety of regulatory alternatives. What can the Office of Management and Budget do? The Office of Management and Budget part of the executive office of the president, oversees all regulations issued by um, federal executive agencies. And so the Office of Management and Budget, through something called the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which has the power to throw regulations back to agencies and delay regulations if the analysis is not done properly, um, we've suggested that they could be more vigorous in uh, critiquing the Homeland Security Department's analysis of these three things, um, and that they should probably better flesh out in the executive order uh, the agency's responsibility to look at alternatives that are outside the scope of uh, the legislation that the agency's acting under. Finally, what could Congress do? One thing Congress could do is steer, don't row. That is, you know, the reason we have regulatory agencies is that Congress wants to give them a, a general problem and let the experts at the regulatory agency figure out what to do. Uh, so in the case of Homeland Security, gee, they ought to do that. They ought to lay out what results Congress expects, but then give the agency greater discretion to figure out how to accomplish that so that they can take costs into account, they can look at costs, they can look at benefits, they can look at what alternatives are going to be more effective, and they can look at not doing things that aren't effective. Um, we also suggested that if Congress is going to continue to pass very narrow laws that mandate what kind of regulations Homeland Security has to issue, then Congress ought to arrange to have the regulatory analysis done ahead of time. Um, now, you know, folks will say, well, you don't realize the agency shouldn't look at alternatives because Congress has already looked at the alternatives. Yeah. In reality, the way it usually often works in Congress is somebody gets an idea and they push it, which is a little different from saying, here's a problem, what are all the different ways we could solve it? And our other suggestion is that when Congress passes laws for this stuff, they ought to set realistic deadlines that actually make it possible to do good analysis before the regulation is written. And, oh, this thing just went blank, so I must be out of material. I don't, 
I don't know if I talked too long. Only a few people were falling asleep. That's usually pretty good. Thank um, you. And so, and. I also rushed through a lot of stuff that maybe sounds like inside baseball. So if there was things that you say, wait a minute, that's kind of abstract or weird or, you know, insider talk, say something and I'll be happy to, you know, go into more detail on it. Questions? Yeah. How do you feel about sunsetting regulations as opposed to analyzing the benefits from the inside? Like you were talking about economists, but setting dates and... Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, as a general principle, I think sunsets make a lot of sense. There are some states that have sunset laws where you actually have a sunset commission that will review a whole agency, not just individual regulations. Um, but, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that, that uh, in a lot of cases anyway, that, yeah, regulation ought to have an expiration date. And if it's not reexamined and renewed by that date, then it disappears. And, you know, in practice, what that does really is creates an impetus to reexamine the regulation to actually analyze, okay, this has been in place for five years now. This has been in place for 10 years now. There's a track record. We should have been gathering data on this. We thought this would be effective 10 years ago or five years ago. Let's look at what the facts show, you know, since it was enacted and try to figure out, you know, did it really have the effect we intended it to have or not? Um, you know, in general, I think that analysis will be done better if it's done outside the agency that issued the regulation. Uh, but yeah, in general, it's a good idea. You, I remember, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, Alan Greenspan was uh, testifying in front of some congressional committee, and he said he favored sunset for all federal agencies. And some congressmen thought they were going to nail him, and they said, even the Federal Reserve? And he said, well, yeah, of course, for the Federal Reserve, too. <laughs> Instead of uh, hiring more economists, I mean, to what extent did these agencies use outside consultants to do this sort of analysis? Oh, I, outside consultants rather than economists? Or to what extent oh. do they do that right now? Oh. To what extent would that work in the future? So. Yeah. That count of economists that I gave you, um, that is, in all cases, that's people who work full time for the agency uh, who are economists, uh, and that doesn't include. You know, contractors and other folks they might hire. And in fact, last week I actually presented this at the Department of Homeland Security to their economists, which was kind of fun. And uh, it's kind of like, you know, presenting grade results to a class um, where nobody scored above a C. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but actually, in general, their attitude was, yeah, we know we we know we need to do a lot better on this stuff. Uh, but uh, what was the question again? Uh, uh, to what extent, A, to what extent do they use um, asset consultants to do the job that oh. economists would do? And B, would you recommend instead of hiring more economists, they just use more asset consultants? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. One of the things that they said last week was, hey, you're not counting consultants. And we used a decent number of consultants on some of this stuff. Um, and, and none of those numbers include consultants. And so to... You know, if all the federal agencies use about the same proportion of consultants, then the numbers I showed you are pretty accurate. If some agencies use a lot more consultants than others, then they may be skewed a little bit. But I don't know. I think 19,000 to 10 or 19,000 to 1 is a pretty high ratio. And there probably is uh, some room to have some folks there full time whose job it is to critique and, and analyze before they regulate. Um, now, you know, could they use more folks on the outside too? Yeah, probably. Uh, you talk about uh, what is the analysis that has to go into this. Yeah. But I see that, you know, there is, uh, even with the six rules, there is a uh, quantity of information you have to gather. So where do you draw the line? You know, what is the right amount of information and how do you limit uh, the regulation uh, research that you have to do in such a way that it's optimal, right? Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. You don't, you don't want to waste time and waste money gathering a whole lot of information where, you know, having a certain chunk of data 
might mean you could make the regulation $10 less expensive, uh, but you spend $100 million getting the data. Uh, yeah, I think with these kind of regulations where they're creating ex expenditures um, by citizens or by businesses uh, that are more than $100 million a year, uh, it's probably worth a decent size investment to uh, you know, do the analysis, gather data, buy data, create ways to gather data if they, if they haven't uh, had ways to gather data. So I, I don't think there are too many aspects of these kind of really big regulations where you really have to, where we really get to the point where you might say, oh gee, I think they're probably doing more analysis than it's worth. Now for smaller, for less significant regulations, yeah, that's, that's, certainly, a, uh, that's certainly a bigger issue. But I, I guess my short answer to your question is I, I understand the concern. I don't think on the big regulations they're anywhere close to being on the other side of the optimum yet. So. Um, you know, doing a little more, doing a little more analysis is probably, probably good. Um, I know you found that agencies are best at cost-benefit regulation, but I'm wondering um, if the discount rate that they might use, if you think that's um, optimal, or if maybe um, they could do that in a better way. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not even. We're, we weren't even judging, um, you know, what discount rate they used. Essentially, the the way the executive order is written, the agencies are told you will do a calculation with a 3% discount rate and you will do a calculation with a 7% discount rate. And if you want to do other stuff, you're welcome to uh, also. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of agnostic on what the heck the, the appropriate discount rate is. And I think what we were doing was not nearly at that level of detail um, where that's going to make a big difference. I mean, heck, we were... You know, we were, we were looking at things like, did they even identify all the main categories of costs? Much less, you know, how the heck did they discount them uh, into the future? So, I think, yeah, it's a level of detail we didn't really get, get far enough down to. I can't remember who did this, but recently someone came out with a, um, an article saying that we shouldn't spend anything on um, terrorism defense since um, most of the uh, it's so expensive generally you um, you just deter people from one target and move them toward another um, and it would be better just to save that money and use it to compensate victims of terrorism so how do you feel about that idea you know that's a tough one because I'm thinking there's about a 25 percent chance the person who wrote that might have been my colleague at Mercatus Center Veronique de Rugi who's been very critical of the the uh, spending side of the um, uh, Homeland Security stuff, uh, you know, finding, I don't know if she's the one who found that it was, you know, the, the high priority terrorist targets that got funding for protection included like the Amish festival in Indiana and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, I was gonna say, I don't think she's the one who discovered that, but she probably, she probably publicized it. Um, I think it's an excellent question. I think it's an excellent question. The, 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 you know, off the cuff, my principal, the, well, not my principal objection, off the cuff, the, the principal objection that's likely to run into is, uh, well, yeah, that's great to say, you know, and, well, okay, let me be blunt about it, because this is the kind of criticism you have to put up with if you do this stuff for a living, right? You know, the, the way that that view would be characterized is, oh, that's great, you say you're not going to do anything to protect people, instead you're just going to give their family some money after their, after their loved ones are dead. Um, I mean, that sort of on a gut level, that's, that's probably the principal argument against that approach, um, you know, which may or may not have, have, uh, have merit to it. Uh, I, I think probably a more, a more significant um, argument for, say, restraint on spending and restraint on regulation when it comes to Homeland Security is, you know, you don't want to give people money to do stuff. You don't want to give individuals or businesses or other levels of government money to do stuff that they would have done anyway and that they had adequate incentives to do uh, anyway. Uh, and, I, and I'm not sure if the folks who make Homeland Security policy always get that lesson. That there, you know, when when people talk about say protecting electric plants and critical infrastructure and so forth, I kind of scratch my head and think, well, 
you know, do these companies that have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in this stuff, you know, do railroads have adequate incentives to protect rail lines from, you know, terrorist attack? And, you know, it seems to me they have pretty, some pretty significant incentives to, to do it. Um, so we're, we're probably, we, the federal government is probably spending some money and doing some stuff to uh, essentially get people to do stuff that they would have done anyway because it was in their own self-interest to protect their assets, protect their customers. Uh, you know, in another publication from Mercatus, a great counterexample um, that illustrates that. In, in, in uh, Israel, it's, now I've never been to Israel, but our, our co-author on this other piece spent like 30 years doing counterterrorism stuff with the JAG, with the Israeli JAG Corps. And he, and he spends like half his time, or a lot of his time in Israel, not half. But uh, apparently it's, it's very difficult to find a restaurant or coffee shop in Israel that doesn't have guards at the door checking people's bags and, and so forth. The interesting thing is there's no law or regulation that says they have to do this. And he, he tells me that no, basically any restaurant or coffee shop in Israel uh, that doesn't have uh, guards at the door is going to find it's also not going to have any customers because nobody's going to think it's safe and nobody's going to want to go in. Uh, so you know, it's another example of even you know, personal security, which is often thought of as a public good that only government can provide, in the right, in the right framework and with the right set of incentives, you get you know, people taking those measures themselves. And you know, if we have more questions, I promise not to talk as much in response to the questions. Will that help? Um, you said a little bit about um, it would it would be a good idea for some of these like Department of Homeland Security to take more time in assessing these regulations. But the first thing I thought of is, well, it seemed like after 9-11, everyone was calling for, you know, something has to be done, something has to be done, and it has to be done now. So it seems like there's a tremendous amount of public pressure uh, for something to be done, anything to be done. Um, and certainly from an economist's point of view, well, I mean, we should do a cost-benefit analysis. But as far as public opinion goes, and, and certainly in Congress, it's let's just do something now, uh, at least, you know, to, to get the public off our back in, from the viewpoint of Congress. I mean, how do you... That seems like there's some conflict there, but how do, you, how do you possibly balance that? I mean, might you be asking something of, of the Department of Homeland Security, which simply isn't politically feasible, and they are you know, a political organization, part of the executive branch? Oh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good issue. Um, you know, something to think about and study as you're hanging out in Washington this year, or, or in state capitals, where, wherever, our, uh, wherever our state fellows are, I can't see them. Uh, but something to think about uh, that, that's kind of interesting is, uh, you know, are, to what extent is what government doing essentially just sort of responding to private interests, you know, redistributing wealth, you know, given to the people with political clout and so forth? To what extent is it responding to public pressure, say, you know, to do, do something about something? And to what extent is the motivation to not really to do something, but to appear to do something? That, that'll kind of calm everybody down, you know, even, even if they haven't done, even if whatever the something was hasn't really accomplished much, uh, does that somehow satisfy some political demand out there on the part of people who just want to see the government do something and the government does something and they feel better, but, you know, even if it's not all that effective? Um, you know, do, are there a bunch of people who feel a lot safer because my wife was not allowed to bring a mayonnaise jar of very small lizards onto an airplane the summer after 9-11? Uh, with, true story, true story in, in Miami. So she took him to the ladies' room and um, let them loose there. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they found their way home. Um, well, because she couldn't open them in the airport because <laughs> any place in public because people would think she was, you know, d doing some sort of terrorist act or something. Uh, so she was like, where can I let these things out of the jar where nobody will see me? Uh, what was the question? <laughs> oh, oh. There, no, wait, I'm sorry, I remember the question, that, but I, I did have a second, uh, a second piece of the answer. Because the one, the one piece is think about, think about what's really motivating folks to do things. Um, and and you now think about is, is, there a, is, there, is, is there sort of a political demand out there that's satisfied just because you know, somebody's taking some action even if it's not going to be 
uh, even if it's not going to be all that effective. Um, now, oh, now the other the other side of my response was, well, you know, if we're really in that situation where you know anything that I've talked about here that would be good is just politically impossible to do, well, then you know we might as well pack up and go home and do something else for a living. Um, you know, I would like to be an optimist, and there, there's actually a, uh, this actually goes back to a, a really significant point about your view of of how the political process works. If we are stuck in a world, and, and the, if non-economists, if you don't follow this, it's okay. If we are stuck in a world that's very tightly in equilibrium all the time, that means politics is always in equilibrium as well, and the only way anything could ever change is because some random thing happens that upsets things and then you have to find a new political equilibrium. If, on the other hand, uh, you know, the world, whether it's markets or politics or whatever, is not locked tightly into some sort of an equilibrium, but there's an opportunity for you know, creativity and innovation and change to happen because you know, innovative people who are within the system do stuff that make change happen, then there are opportunities for you know, people like us who come to Washington because we want to you know, learn something and do some good. There are opportunities like us to do some things that would actually be productive and improve things because we don't have to try to change some sort of a political equilibrium we're locked into, all you need to do is you know, get the right ideas to the right people at the right time who, who are in, in the position to make some improvements. And I, I like the second view, partly because partly of my background's in Austrian economics, but also partly because it means I can be an optimist and not be like totally depressed every day when I'm in uh, Washington. I was just curious, um, you outlined uh, six key steps in a regulatory analysis, and um, you mentioned that um, it wasn't decision-making 101, that uh, going through these steps was um, often controversial. And I was just wondering if there were any, any uh, particular um, steps in this process that you did with Department of Homeland Security that uh, was especially controversial. Um, I, I didn't know if, if you could elaborate on that. Um, well, controversial to whom? I mean, no, none of this stuff, my co-author, Jamie, she, I mean, she's a, she's a lawyer, I'm an economist, you would think we would have some different perspectives, but, you know, we kind of sat down and under each of the, um, under each of the pieces of the uh, analysis, fleshed out three or four major questions to ask and stuff to look for. Then we each went off and we read all these things and scored them and came back together, and our scores on each individual criterion never differed by more than one point. Uh, so, I mean, I think it, it is possible for kind of, you know, reasonable people to, to have, you know, pretty similar views of this kind of stuff. Now, what did the folks at, at Department of Homeland Security yes. think about some of these kinds of things? Uh, you know, I think the, I think the biggest issues or problems that folks run into are the, well, wait, let me back up. When we started this, I didn't know if asking some of these questions or applying some of these criteria would be, would be kind of sensitive or set off people's alarm bells or, you know, get people really mad at us. Because that happens with other types of regulation. Uh, and probably the best example is environmental regulation. Uh, and well, environment, health, and safety, where you start talking about costs and then people say, oh, how can you possibly talk about costs when we're talking about saving lives? Well, really with the regulation, you're talking about reducing risk and it's legitimate to ask, you know, which ways reduce risk more, and if there's a lower cost way to reduce risk by a lot more, then maybe you want to do the lower cost thing. But, you know, people who don't, aren't necessarily trained to think analytically don't, don't, aren't going to think about it that way. Um, so those are the areas where this is really controversial. I wasn't sure if the Homeland Security stuff, if we were going to get a reaction more like the reaction when folks work on environment, health, health and safety, where certain issues of, particularly issues of cost, uh, get a lot of people riled up. Or if it was going to be more like the other area that I mostly work on, which is economic regulation, where there's pretty much a consensus about what kind of values and goals economic regulation is supposed to, um, supposed to further. It's supposed to further consumer welfare you know, in a material sense where things like you know, what consumers pay for stuff is really important. Uh, and so when you ask those kind of questions, dealing with economic regulation, 
you don't normally have people throwing pointy things at you because you asked the question. They may disagree with your answer, um, but you know, it's perfectly legitimate when you're looking at telecom regulation or energy regulation to say, well, you know, what kind of cost does this impose on consumers? And most people who are active and involved in that field will say, well, yeah, that's a legitimate question to ask, and we want to know that answer. Um, Homeland Security wasn't sure where, where it was going to be. Um, and I guess the reaction's been kind of in the middle. I mean, we've talked to people in the, in the department. We've talked to people on Capitol Hill about this stuff. And so far, I haven't run into anybody who has really objected to the idea of asking those questions. Now, they may say it's impossible to answer some of them or it's impossible to quantify some of them, or it's really, really hard to do it right. But I haven't run into anybody who have said, who's said, you know, just the, the issue of cost is just inappropriate to talk about with Homeland Security, or uh, comparing the effectiveness of alternatives is inappropriate to talk about because if we have two alternatives that'll both reduce risk, well, we ought to do them both because we're trying to save lives. Uh, I, I think there, there's a, a growing realization even this is going to sound bad. I was about to say even in Congress. That, and I'm not down on congressmen, but that, that's the area. No, that's just the area where there's probably least time to do analysis. I mean, if you've ever met, if, if you meet people who work on Capitol Hill, by nature, they have to be generalists. It, 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 I've worked on Capitol Hill. I mean, it would drive, drive a lot of people nuts trying to work in that environment because there's like a million things going on. And everybody's time is very constrained. It just, there just isn't a lot of time to like sit down with one problem for a couple of days and think through it. Um, and, and so it's not an environment that's conducive to doing an analysis that takes a year to do. Um, so if you, if, but, but even with folks we've talked about on Capitol Hill, nobody's really objected to answering these questions. And, he, and even in that environment, I think there's a growing realization that, yeah, it makes sense that we don't have enough resources to do everything that might be a good idea. You know, even if you can throw out the bad ideas and have this big pile of things that are all good ideas, um, there's a realization that, hey, we can't afford to do everything. And so we have to, we have to prioritize somehow. Um, so that, that, that part, I think, is starting to get through and probably the biggest I think the biggest political danger to this kind of rational approach is really not the, not the, oh my gosh, we're trying to save lives, don't bother me with your analysis um, attitude, but rather the, hey, you know, I'm trying to get another 10 million for my police department back home, and so we need to put this little thing in the bill. It's sort of the, or, the, the kind of pork barrel politics as usual stuff uh, that's probably a bigger threat to you know, doing rational stuff in, in Homeland Security than you know, people who are aghast at the idea of, of thinking about it at all.